sure there's some things God laid on my heart. I want to make sure that you hear and understand. I want you to not only that, just get it in your spirit. You know, get, you got you to understand your authority. You got to understand what, what God has given you <clears throat> on the Great Commission. <clears throat> and hopefully you all have gotten a good, a little bit of a better understanding from some of the stories and some of the things we've dealt with on deliverance to learn it. And, and uh, like I said, we'll see where Jesus told us to do it. Amen. Gonna be move on, we're going to be over in section 15. Section 15. Like I said, we're obviously we're not going to be able to touch everything on here. With uh, you'd have to take two or three days. But th this, you know, the manual. That's why I give it to y'all. You can take it back to your churches and teach it. Go over it and study the scriptures and see what God's trying to say in it. Because this is all has to. It's all tied with deliverance and healing and, and all that stuff and what God wants us to do. Uh, there's a section there, you know, putting on the full armor of God. Um, you know, we have to put on the full armor. We can't, we can't not put something on. You got to make sure you got the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit. If you, if there's something that you, that you have missing on your armor, then you're not going to be effective. You got to, he said, put on the whole armor of God. And we've got, and we've got to do that. When we don't, we're, we're not effective. So that's, that's one of the, that's something I want you all to study. You know, study the armor of God because I won't be able to touch it today because there's other things I feel like I need to get to. But go over that and get that in you and, and get it in your spirit and un try to understand it, the helmet of salvation. Because when you got the full armor on, that's where your protection is. Amen. And you, and you notice there's no armor on the backside. God has your back. Amen. But we got to prepare. We got to put, we got to prepare with the gospel of our feet, the belt of truth. If we're not walking in truth, we're not going to be effective for God's, you know, if we're not living it and walking it, the, the the breastplate of, of righteousness, this is all keys. These are all keys to walking in as being a deliverance minister. You have to have it all on. You've got you to understand it. So uh, study the full armor. Get it in you. And uh, don't take it off. You know, go to sleep with it. Wake back up. We don't, listen, we don't. The devil doesn't take, you, you might take a vacation, but the devil don't. Amen. He doesn't take vacations. When you, the moment you slip up, he's going to try to get in. So... That's why it says, be sober and vigilant. We already went over that. So we're going to look at 15. He says, he, meaning Jesus, commanded his disciples to cast demons out. And the devil looks, likes to say, and he's got the doctrines out of, well, we don't do that anymore and all this. He loves that stuff. He loves to take the power out of the gospel. Why? Because it exposes him. It exposes him. Like I said, now has the time came that we expose this. And expose the witchcraft and things like that that are going on. So many people deceived. I know people that they call themselves Christians and they're in witchcraft too. Angel cards and things like this. It's not of God. They're, they're, they're deceived and they're living in confusion because they're trying to operate out of two kingdoms and it won't happen. Nothing but confusion. But we see in Matthew 10, 1, it says, And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, remember Judas being one of them, he gave them power over unclean spirits. To cast them out. Did he say counsel them? Did he say give them a massage on a Sunday morning? He said cast them out. Right. Up and out in Jesus name. And to what? Heal all kinds of sickness. He didn't say some. He didn't say you know you can heal this one. Not that. He said heal all kinds of sickness. Listen the same disease has been around for years. We might have a few more added to it. But listen Jesus healed them all. His disciples had moments where they healed them all. All kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. This was his command. This was a great commission to his disciples. This is the great commission to you and I. You need to get this in you. That if you're a disciple of Jesus, he's giving you the command to do these things. Cast out demons, heal the sick, and heal all kinds of disease. It's not what I say. It's what the Bible says. You have to decide. I can't make you believe it. But I'm telling you, if you'll believe it and you operate in faith in the finished work of the cross and what Jesus has done, you will see these things in your life. But if you sit back on the sidelines and say, well, I don't know if this is for me, and you keep listening to the devil, you'll never see the power of God. You've never seen the sick healed because you've never prayed for the sick. You've never seen demons cast out because you haven't tried to cast out demons. It does work. His word works if you work the word. You've got to work the word. So he told us to do that. And... I want to show you the power. He said he gave him power. At this moment, 
In Matthew 10, they were not filled with the Holy Ghost. They weren't endued with dynamite power from on high. This was an authority. This was delegated authority just like a president would have. He's given them authority over those things. Not power. Not in the power like the, the, the dynamite power was not yet available. He was under the umbrella. He said, I've given you authority over them. If you look, if you look at the word, author, the power in this context and in the scripture, it's, it's, it's exousia. It's exousia. You, should, you may have G, uh, Greek, uh, G1832. And it is, um, and when you look at it, it's delegated influence, authority, jurisdiction, liberty, power, right, and strength. So he's given that to you. It's like a president would have, would have power. So this power comes from who? Jesus. He delegates that authority to his, to his believers. And this is when he was sending out the 12. Uh, and a lot of times... Spirits of infirmity has to be cast out before people's healed. If they have a spirit of infirmity, it needs to be cast out. We've seen that with a woman that was, that was bent over and yeah. that we read about earlier, that it was a spirit of infirmity. Satan had bound her, but Jesus came to loose her from them infirmities. Listen, all, all sickness and disease comes from the devil. It came after the fall. It entered in through demons and demonic power when... when when uh, Adam and Eve sinned, fell against God, he, he, they handed the keys over. Here, here, devil, you can have our kingdom. It was that quick, that fast, keys were handed over. And it took Jesus that many years. To, he, he, he returned. He fixed it. He made things right. And now you and I as believers can walk in that. And we can, we can go about doing good, healing. Like Jesus, God, I think it's Acts 10, 38. God uh, anointed Jesus of Nazareth to go about doing good, healing all kinds of sickness, all those who are oppressed of the devil. He anointed to do that. That's what, he called, and that's what we're called to do. He's anointed us to do that, to destroy the works of the enemy, to destroy the works of the enemy. So what I have to do as a, as a minister and as a teacher is to get you to believe that, get you to understand that, get you out of fear of man and fear of people. You have to just get, you just have to get, and that's why, well, how do you do that? Die to self. The, the faster you can die, the more effective you'll be. Amen. And quit fearing people, quit fearing man who cares about what people think. We've got to walk in that authority. So we see here, are you a disciple for Jesus? Are you a disciple for Jesus? Yeah. This is you. This is you. He's speaking to you. The word speaks to you. His word never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. In 2,000 years, his word will say the same thing. Amen. Yeah. It's going to minister to his church the same way. It's not going to change. It's not going to change. Why we see these big men, Pastor Tom was talking yesterday, we, the, these healing, they had these healing ministries in the 50s and 60s, and all of a sudden the church just moved some of these men out of the church. They didn't like the way they'd done things. They didn't like how Jack Coe wrestled around with people. They didn't, they didn't like the way they done things, so they pushed them out of the mainstream denominations. And these guys, a lot of them went independent, you know. And they pushed the power of God out of the churches. And we see what it's left today. A bunch of people in churches sitting under the influence of demons. Because they're not being told truth. They're not being told truth. Now they've got, we've got what's entered in is doctrines of men have entered in. Well, we, we, this denomination believes this, and this one believes this. Look, I mean, it's, 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 well, we, we messed up somewhere. We've messed up somewhere. It can't be that. It's time to bring it back together. Amen. It's time to start doing what Jesus told us to do. Just get busy doing the word. Amen. The word works. We see the same thing in Mark 16 and 17. Jesus tells us to go into all the world. Preach the gospel. Those who believe will be baptized. Those who don't believe, they're going to be condemned. But he said, those that you minister to and those that are baptized, those that decide to believe, he said, these signs are going to follow them. And the first thing he says is cast out demons. Amen. How do we know the kingdom of heaven is at hand when demons are casted out? That was one thing that was done, like I told you earlier, in the New Testament before, and when Jesus showed up, that didn't happen before, was the casting out of demons. And that's how we know the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We know it's here. We know it's upon us. When you see demons coming out of people, you know the kingdom of heaven is at hand and it's drawn near to you. So now you have to decide to believe it or not. I, I'm not convincing people anymore, even trying to convince people of deliverance. You either believe it or you don't. I've seen people see miracles. They've been healed. They've been blessed. They've been delivered. And they still don't believe. Yeah. They'll still walk away from God. Amen. Had them here in this church. People been healed, been blessed. Well, I don't believe, they're, in, they're in doctrines of demons now. We don't teach that over here. We don't do, they don't believe this over here. You've been deceived. You've seen it. So listen, people's going to see 
and they still ain't going to believe. So quit trying to convince people. Preach the gospel. Keep your eyes on Jesus and go after him. Quit trying to please people. Quit trying to convince them. Let God do that. Let the Holy Spirit do that. But he says the first thing they would do, they would cast out demons. They would speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. If they drink anything deadly, it's not going to hurt them. And he said they'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. This word hasn't changed. It's still here for today. It's still here for you and I. You just need to believe it. Amen. We just got to decide say, yep, this is for me. I'm going to do it. Yeah. You got to do it. You got to do it. It's what the Bible, this, is, this is the commandment of Jesus. This is words. It's what he tells us. So it's the believer's authority. It's not the pastor's authority. It is the pastor's authority, but it doesn't say these signs will follow pastors. These signs will follow the apostle. These signs will follow. No, he said these signs will follow those who believe. Yeah. Amen. Trying to get in your spirit right now. Amen. Those who believe. If you're a believer, this is you. Yeah. Take it and grab it for yourself. Say, this is mine. God said it. I believe it. That settles it, and I'm going. Sorry, devil, it's time to put you on notice. Come out of my community. Come out of my home. Come out of my family. Come out of my body. Come out of my finances. Up and out. Time to put him on the run. Use your authority. The devil is defeated. He knows it. But he don't want you to know it. So you've got to know it and you've got to have it and you've got to believe it that he's defeated. Then when you encounter him, he has to go. He has to come out. He has no authority. Jesus took it all, and he delegated it over to us. He said, I'm seated at the right hand of the Father. I'm done. It's finished. So what you don't do, you can sit here if you want to, but what you don't do, it's not going to get done. He's done God has done all he's going to do. It's up to me and you. He's given us that authority. We're, if we're going to see a difference in our community... If you're going to see a difference in your neighborhood, in your family, your workplace, it's going to be you. Because he's told you to do it. If you've got somebody sick at your workplace, you lay hands on them. What if I don't see them healed? Who cares? You can stand before Jesus and say, Jesus, you told me to done it. I I did it. I don't don't care if I ever see another person healed or delivered. I'm going to keep doing it. Why? Because the Bible commands us to. See, we've got to get over us. Oh, what if I don't get, who cares? I've seen, we've prayed for people and they haven't been healed. But we've prayed for a lot and they have been healed. Listen, I'm just doing what the Bible says and I'm learning along the way. And God will honor that. He's not going to honor your complacency and, well, I don't know if that was for me. And, you know, what if we don't see him? He's not, he's not, that's not, he's not going to, he's not going to honor that. He's going to honor somebody that's doing it. Say, you know what, they're doing it, they believe. And it's like I heard it preached the other night. Faith is an action word and I've always said that. If you believe it, then you need to do it. If you're not doing it, then that means you don't believe it. I said, if you're not doing it, that means you don't believe it. If you're not casting demons out, you don't believe it. If you're not laying hands on the sick, you don't believe it. If you're not preaching the gospel, you don't believe it. Y'all done got quiet on me again. I'm just telling you. If you believe believe in something, you're going to do it. You're going to do it. You're going to do it. So we see that believer's authority. Like I said before, it doesn't say we're going to counsel demons, medicate them, we're going to cast them out. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say preach a lukewarm message so we don't upset demons. I plan on it. If people come in with demons, I plan on them getting upset. I plan on the Word of God convicting them and something stirring up on the inside. Stoves, toes getting stepped on. It's out of love, but I plan on that. I plan on times that people get up and walk out. It happens. It's okay. I'm okay with it. It's not for them. They're not ready. They're not ready for salvation. They like their idols too much. When we come in there and we stomp on their Disney and all their little Disney idols, they get a little upset. And they don't come back. And that's okay. They're not ready for truth. That's, job, that's God's job to convict them. I'm, I'm not going to sit there and water all this down just to get people to come in. They have to have truth. They have to know that Satan is after their kids. They have to know that. And he's infiltrating any way he can. The doctrines of demons in the, in, the, in the schoolhouses. You know, all the LGBT, all this stuff they're trying to push, these agendas. All we need is reading, writing, and arithmetic. I don't need, I don't need, church, I don't need um, teachers telling my kids about sexuality and all that stuff. I don't need that. I don't need the government. I don't need the government doing that. We could do that ourselves. Amen. Praise God, Kentucky stepped up, and they're doing something about that. So 
Uh, they'll warn, now they're going to let uh, the parents know before they do any kind of teaching on any kind of sexuality. So, and it's, and it's going to have to be after sixth grade, I think. So there, some things are happening, which is good. God's in it. That's the power of prayer. Yeah, and I'm telling you, that, that community, the LGBT community, I love them. I pray for them. Yeah. But they're after your kids. Yeah. All you got to do is pull up some of the videos they have, the chants they do. Listen, they're after them kids. Yeah, right, right. And they're, in, they're infiltrating every way they can. Be sober, be vigilant, and be watchful because they're coming. Amen. They're coming. And they want to get those spirits in your kids. And whatever way they can do it, we've got to protect them. We've got to protect them. So we can't dance around the truth. We've got to, not to stir up the devils, we've got to preach the truth. Luke 6, 26 says, Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers of the false prophets. They spoke, spoke well of them. Quit trying to please people. I talked about that a little bit earlier. We talked about that. Well, when men, when all men speak well, listen, if you're, if you're casting demons out and you're, and you're preaching the Bible, people's going to come against you. It's okay. It's okay to have enemies. I know when I got enemies on my tail and people's out talking and they're, listen, you know you're on the right track, right? You know, you know that, that God's with us. And they, they beat Paul and Silas, threw them in jail for preaching the gospel and, and casting witchcraft out of their county and community and burning it all up. You know, so it's going to happen when you do these things. It's going to happen. That, I don't know if you all remember Pastor Greg Locke last year. He had a big, a big book burning thing. And, man, they did everything they could to shut him down. Guys, it's real. And what he done was biblical. You know, what he done was biblical. When people truly get saved, they get all their idols together and they get them out of their house and they go burn them. And that's the conviction of the Holy Ghost. That's when you know you got saved. That's what happened to me when, when, when I got saved. I, I told y'all this morning, I'd come to the house after, you know, God had filled me with his Holy Spirit, delivered me. I said, wife, I told my wife, I said, Dawn, I don't, I don't know what's happened. Something's different. But God began to show me the things that need to go out of my house. And they started going. You know, as the Holy Spirit's like, no, this ain't of God, this ain't of me. And he, it's a work he done. The desire change. So they're, they're, that's, that's the fruits of repentance. And I'm just, I'm just using myself for example. I'm not bragging about it. I'm just telling you, it's, that's when there's a change, there's a change. And there's something different. You no longer desire those other things. I had to separate from a lot of friends for a season. Because where, where God was taking me, they, they wasn't ready for. God had to, kind of like Paul did, he took, um, he, took, he took Paul to the Arabian Desert for three and a half years. And the Holy Spirit, Jesus himself was, was working with him, working with him, growing him up, showing him the scriptures, what he already knew, but revealing himself to him. And then when he was ready, he could go out. And that's what happened. God will take you in for a season and separate you, work on you, so you can go back and rescue those out of the fire, which is exactly what happened. He's got to separate you for a season, fill you with his word, fill you with his power, and then you come out, and he, when he's ready to reveal you, he'll reveal you. And now it's time to go win those people that you were separated from for a little while and tell them, look, this stuff's real. Here's the kingdom. Bring a demonstration, get them free, and bring them into the kingdom. Amen? And that's what we're supposed to do. So we see here, uh, if you're not stirring up the fake Christians and they're not coming against you, you're probably not preaching the Jesus of the Bible. A whole lot of wannabes out there. Listen, I tell people, look, just because just somebody calls herself a Christian doesn't mean they're a Christian. Because Jesus said, he said, you're going to know them by their name tags, right? Did he say that? He said, you're going to know them by the fruit. I don't look at the names. I can care less what people tell me they are. I look at the fruit. That's where we're, we're supposed to judge the fruit. Oh, don't judge me. I'm, ju I'm looking for your fruit. Shake it. I say, Give me right. We can shake that tree a little bit. Find out, what's, find out what kind of fruit falls out of it. We're going to shake the fruit tree. And we do a good job of it here. We're going to find out what, listen, I want to know what kingdom your roots are in. If you are who you say you are. And that's how we got to, listen, folks, we can't quit believing everything that somebody tells you. We're just so deceived. He says there's going to be many that come in that wolves in sheep's clothing. He didn't say shepherd's clothing, sheep's clothing. They're going to come in and they're going to try to blend in with the sheep and then they're going to try to destroy the church. That's how they do it. That's how they infiltrate. You've got to watch it. Listen, they got witches on prayer teams. Even Pastor Greg Locke's exposed them. Man, you got to, listen, you got to have discernment. You got to be praying. If something ain't right, don't look right, smell right, it might not be right. You know, if it's too good to be true, like they always said. So Luke 9, 1, let's see what it says. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure 
sick, uh, to cure diseases. So he said he give, the, he give his disciples power, what? And authority over all, all demons. Did he say the big principalities? Just, he said, did he say all of them except for the big principalities over the region, over your state? And he said, did he say any of that? They're all demons, right? So I don't care how big the devil tries to make you. Like, look, you got, you got, you got charismatic people that are scared of the devil. Oh, you can't mess with the devil. Why? He's defeated. He's defeated. He's spoiled. The Bible says he's on the cross. He spoiled what? Principalities and powers and all the rulers of the darkness of this age. He spoiled them. He defeated them. They have no power. The only power they have is the power that you give them in, their li in your life. That's the only power they have is what a person gives them. And he tries to come in through deception. Principates all demons. So when one tries to tell you he's this kind of demon, who cares? You're defeated too. Come out. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm showing you this stuff for a reason. Because we, we, when we read, see, we, we know the scriptures. We know them, but we read over them all the time. We miss these things. He said all. All means all. And we've got to leave it there, okay? So, and like I said, we just got to figure things out. Luke 10, 17. So look, not only did he send the 12 out, he sent the 70 out. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Man, they were excited. I get excited when I cast demons out in Jesus' name. It is exciting to see people set free and saved by the glory of God. That's exciting. But he said, don't rejoice in that. He said, rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. Yeah. He said rejoice in that. Amen. But I like rejoicing and kicking the demon's butt. Right. Listen, I, I like rejoicing in that in Jesus' name. Because listen, I was oppressed and depressed and controlled by him for many years. So I get a joy out of kicking his butt. Every time we get a chance. I tell people, I say, look, if that's a hobby, I, we can do that. If that could be a hobby. Because that's fun. But he said don't rejoice in that. But what I want you to see, he sent the 70 out. So it just wasn't the 12, what they call original apostles. He sent the 70 out and give them power. That's, that's all of us. That's all of us. Every single one of you in here today, I don't care what the devil's trying to lie and tell you right now, every single one of you today have power and authority to cast out demons. Amen. What you got to do is just get started. Once you get the first one out, the rest of it, you, know, you just got to keep going. You'll figure it out as you go. Absorb the information. Like I said, you got the demon slayers out there. There's all kinds of books. Just get that stuff in you. And as you go doing it, you'll start things that start coming to you. Oh, man, I remember reading that. I remember seeing that. And you'll, it'll start coming to you. And as you do it, the, better, you'll, the more you do it, the easier to get and the better you'll flow in it. And you, may, and you may start off, I'm not going to say in the flesh, but you may start off maybe a little cookie cutter. But then as you go, you'll start learning how to flow in the Holy Spirit, and you'll learn, you know, God. So some of them, some deliverance, you'll come in right, right away and start casting them out. Some of them you may have to work in. And sometimes you're going to see that some people ain't ready. They're not ready. You know, we're, we're dealing with the, with the young man now, and, and his wife's here, and it's, he, he's been hurt. He's fragmented. And I said, I said look, he, he's going to he's gonna have to find somebody he trusts first. I'm dealing with two, two like that right now. They've been hurt by Christians. They've been hurt by pastors. I said, I, I can't just go on there and just start, you know, commanding. I said, it ain't going to work like that. We've got to love him. I said, Jesus cast out demons because of compassion and love. I said, they have to know that we love them. Amen. They have to know that they can trust us, that we're not here to hurt them. We're not here to, we're there to love them and show them the love of Christ and, work, and walk them through that deliverance because there's a lot of hurt there. And through that hurt, the demons have come in. So we can get them out, but we got to first build. The more open you can get them and prepare for deliverance, the easier and better it's going to go. And then we br bring that, that, what they call inner healing, some people say, but we bring that healing in. That's, that's where, so there's nothing wrong with um, um, whatever you call it, you know, uh, I don't know, counsel. A little bit of counsel. You need that. It's almost like discipleship. So you counsel them. You affirm them. You show them love. You strengthen them. And what, what the Bible say we talk? You edify them. You build them up with your words and grace. And that's what we do. We build them up and build trust with them, right? That's how we, so, so, uh, so I, I guess I didn't say, so some deliverance, one of the greatest weapons for deliverance is love. Amen. It's love. You can just love people and they can get delivered. Some people, they're just hurt and you come in and you, you hug them and you love them and you pray for them. Bam, they get delivered. Don't even got cast nothing out, it just comes out. 
Because the devil hates love. He's the opposite. He hates love. So love. Then sometimes we command them out. Sometimes I've seen people get delivered by the preaching of the truth of the word of God. He said preach. Preach deliverance to the captives. There's, there's a lot of weapons. I'm saying you can't just go in with one weapon. You've got to learn there's a lot of weapons here that we can use. So you have to be led by the Spirit and how to approach. Not everything's up. Look, I, love, look, I get excited. I love commanding demons out. But not everything's like that. You've got to have discernment. You've got to, have, you've got to be led by the Holy Spirit and let him show you how you need to handle each situation. It's a little different. When people are broken and fragmented, you've got to, you've got to, they've got to have your trust. And that's something you have to build. And that's something that can take a little time. Because you go and just command demons out and get them delivered, send them down the road, they're going to be, it's going to be right back. And that's what's happened. That's what's happened. So it's, it's not a one, sometimes it ain't a one-time thing. It's, it's every case is different. Every case is different. So we don't want to be cookie cutter with stuff. And look, I'm learning myself. I'm just, I'm telling you all by experience. I'm not telling you anything I haven't learned by experience. I'm just sharing with you what we've learned and what we've seen. Um, because I want you to do this. I want you to be deliverers of your generation, to see your children delivered, your families and your friends deliverance. You have that ability to do that, and I want you to know that you do. And I want you to see that in the Scriptures, not because I tell you, but because God tell you, Jesus told you, written by the Holy Spirit. Amen? So I want, I want you to see that. So let's not rejoice in that we get to do it, even though it's good to, you know, we like to rejoice in it, kicking the devil's butt. But he said, rejoice that our names are written in the book of life. Amen? Acts 8, 5, 8, he sees that Philip the evangelist, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them, and the multitudes with one accord heeded things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. So we've seen Philip done that as an evangelist. I know we talked about that a little bit earlier. Uh, some, like I said, some things will be a little bit repetitive, and I'm, and I'm trying not to be. Um, what else I want to go over to and show you all? Um, see what you need here we may go back to this one so uh, go back to the end and it's number 33 Lester Summer I'll come up with this seven steps toward demon possession and, and maybe it'll help you understand how the enemy comes in and begins to influence you in certain ways how he grips our life sometimes. And I've kind of kind of given an explanation. I'll make sure y'all had that copy. It should be toward the back. Um, it's going to be number 33. Number 33. Number 33. Everybody about there? Seven steps toward, is it, is your, is it right in y'all's manuals there? Yeah. Okay. Like I said, I, I, obviously we ain't going to be able to cover everything, but I'm just, there are certain things I want to hit and I want you to see that I feel like God wants you all to see. Because so, this is going to give you an understanding of how these things work. So number one, the first one is regression. So that's the first stage of being, going into, um, being oppressed and influenced by the enemy. Somebody that was, maybe somebody got born again. Maybe they were saved. Um, and basically they begin to revert back. You see what I'm saying? So it's to revert back to earlier behavior patterns or to go backwards. So if you see somebody, even, even maybe they're not even saved, but somebody just begins to go backwards in life. All of a sudden, you notice they're not being able to keep their job. They're not able to show up on time. And th you know, things just start going downhill and downhill. That's the first stage of demon possession. The first stage. And it's very, look, and, and that can be healed really quick by encouragement or, or trying to pull them back in. That's something. Uh, but the first thing is regression. As Christians, we should always be going forward. If you're going backwards, you're regressing. That's not good. That opens the door up for the enemy to come in and be put, put, put oppression, depression, and things like that on you. Begin to move in those areas. Number two is repressing someone. So you begin. So that now they go. So now they're going backwards. Now they begin to be repressed. Repressed is mean they begin to restrain or squeeze. It's to prevent natural expression. Have you ever been in a home? Have you ever been around people that you cannot express yourself to? 
Because you feel like you're squeezed. That's what this is. Sque- like I can't, you know, well, they're going to say something. That, and you feel like your personality and who you want to be. And this happens in churches too. That you can't be yourself because there's something that's squeezing you and repressing you. And you can't express. Listen, God has created us as expressionists. When we're happy, we, we, we shout and we clap. When we're sad, we cry. He, he, he's caused us to be expressionist. Amen. We express our feelings. When somebody's not expressing how they feel and they're not able to do that, they're under regression. Do we see that? Or is it repression? I'm sorry, I'll, I'll probably get them mixed up. No, it's repression. They're under repression. They're, they're, they're being squeezed and restrained. This happens at homes. This happens at schools. This happens in churches. This is real. So what are we going? We're going backwards. Now we're at stage two. And this, this is the best thing. Lester Summerall had this. This, this is one of the best ones I've seen to really exp- explain how people go backwards. So it's to prevent natural expression, to keep down or to hold back. Like I said, God makes us as expressionists. God desires his, uh, his exuberant expression from us. He wants us to be joyful. Yeah, we have emotions and he wants us to express those things. Because by expressing them, people know how we feel and they can maybe be able to help us. The Bible says pray for one another. You know, we pray for one another. We can see, you know, when you know somebody, well, you know when they come through the doors that, look, something's not right. They're, they're, something, they're battling or something. And it's our duty to lift them up, to encourage them, speak life and speak grace to them. That's, our, that's, why, that's why the Bible says don't forsake the assembling of the saints. You've got, you got churches to, oh, you know, I come to church. Listen, you, you go to church. Amen. Get up off your t- couch TV. Get, get your shoes on in the morning and come to church. Amen. Sit there with a latte and espresso watching church on TV. That's not church, folks. That's a supplement. That's a supplement if you can't go. Church is being gathered with the assembling of the saints. There's difference. There's power when we're together. The presence of God is, is powerful when we're together. That's what breaks things off. But see, we, we just, we just the, the devil loves to make you complacent and as comfortable as possible. That's how he wants you. That's how he wants you. So we see, uh, represents homes and people. It could be an overbearing father, an overbearing mother. It could be a, a, a nagging mother or father uh, in the family or a temper tantrum son or a temper tantrum daughter. Wayward or dis- disobedient. Oh, I, I don't really want to say nothing. They might explode. Let them go and explode. I, I plan on it. Amen. I've seen it in churches. You've got to walk on. you got tippy-toeing. Well, you don't want to make her mad, you know. No, go ahead. We, 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 so we go around. and well, You know what it is? You know what that is? It's a form of witchcraft and manipulation. Because they got you thinking that you say something or look at them, or they're going to explode and cause a scene. So what do you do? What's the pastor and the elder? Oh, we don't want to say anything to her. We don't want to say anything to him. I'm going to say something. We'll go ahead and let it blow up and blow out. I'm done. I'm, listen, I'm, I'm, a patty cake church is done. We're not in that season, and it's not that time. I've dealt with it many times in here. And the people that's been with me, they know. I ain't walking on no eggshells. <laughs> Monty's like, look, we ain't walking on no eggshells. We need to be right with God. Amen? That's witchcraft. It happens in houses. You have a disobedient son or disobedient, you're afraid to say anything. And why? Because they blow up and they cause all kinds of trouble. Yep. Listen, cast the demon out of them. Amen. That's your house. You take authority over it. Amen. That's what happens. That's what happens in homes. They repress them. They repress them. And it's, just a, it's a second stage of going on into, into suppression. The workplace, you got an overbearing boss or employer that can't, you know, uh, it, it makes your life a living hell. Y'all ever had an overbearing boss once coming there and just overbear and oppr- you can't express your emotions or do anything? That's what this is talking about. Yeah. It's putting you under that spirit. And I'm going to tell you, if it was me, I'd be finding me another place to work. Man. Because that will get on you and destroy your life if it continues. I tell people, look, I've, I've cut a whole lot of people out of my life and it ain't because I don't love them. It's because they're not pulling me down. They're not, they're not going to kick me off the path of what God's got for me in my life. Amen. You either get on this Holy Ghost train or you get down the road. I love you and I'm going to love you from a distance. I, listen, we got to be like it. This is your, you're going to be the one to stand before Jesus and take account of your life. Not your friend, not your wife, not your, you know, not your work, you know, your, your boss or anything like that. You're going to stand in account. Amen. So you need to make the cuts and the choices that you've got to make. To keep your freedom and keep your walk with God. Man. I don't care if it's, sometimes it could be your own children. It could be your own parents. 
If they're hindering your walk and they're, you know, and they're, they're under some kind of do, demonic, uh, uh, demonic influence, yeah. God cut them away. Love them from a distance. Love them from a distance. Up and out. They already know here. Up and out. I'm not, like I said, I'm not trying to be mean, but this is your walk. This is your calling. And the devil will use the people close to you to stop you. If he can't, if you're, if you're a man and a pastor or whatever, he'll try to your wife. If he can't get to your wife, he'll go to your kids. If he can't get to your kids, he'll go to your parents. He'll, and he'll go to your work. He'll, listen, he finds a way. He finds a way. And you just have to separate yourself from it. So, <clears throat> hallelujah. So our job is to recognize this and encourage and pray with that person. And I think I put some of that in the notes there that y'all see. This, this here is good stuff. This is what you, y'all need to go over this stuff. because You're going to recognize things. It's to equip and train. Um, number three, suppression is to press under or to keep back, to conceal, to exclude desire and feeling. With suppression, we have the concealment or great pressures moving against the victorious life of Christ. So it's just basically to conceal, to, to keep somebody under pressure. It's suppression. It's a stage, it's stage three from, from regress, uh, repression. Then you got suppression. Then you go in from that after being suppressed and being concealed, which means you've you stepped out. So you, now you, you're going to this place where you begin to uh, move away from people. You know, you can't express your emotions. You're being oppressed in a home or whatever, whatever it may be. Now you start secluding yourself from people. And then you go into this part here, stage three, which is suppression. This is all the work of the devil. It's all the work of hell. And some of y'all might be bad on this today. Then we go into four, depression. We've all known people with depression. And what Lester Summerall says, when you get around a, about a five or a six or a seven, you almost need outside help. That's where we're delivering. But up to that point, you can free yourself if it's recognized. That's the importance of this teaching. You might be able to recognize it on yourself and say, you know what, I need to make some changes. I need to make some cuts. I don't think you're here today by accident. So depression is low spirits, gloominess, dejection, sadness, and it's a decrease in force or activity. When people just, you begin to seclude yourself out from all family activities, all activities, this is what you've gone into. That's what people in depression do. They don't want to talk to anybody. They don't want to be around anybody. They don't want to, they don't want to talk to nobody. They just want everybody to leave them alone. They're in, they're in depression. They're in, a, they're in a dangerous state. Sometimes from level one to seven happens quick. And sometimes it's a slow process. You might get one in six months and go to two, another six months. It could be four or five years. And I always wonder, how do, how do Christians, how do they commit suicide? How, you know, I've, I've known about three just in the past six, seven months. And, it, and it's right here. If you'll look and you'll go back and you'll see these symptoms in their life where they just went back and back and back and nobody recognized it, nobody saw it to intervene. That just, I mean, that just shows you how the devil has no respect for a person. He doesn't care who you are. The Bible says we are created, created in the image and likeness of God. Amen. Satan is, and you'll see in the scripture, Satan is kicked out of heaven. He'll never get, he'll never get redeemed. When he looks at you, he, he, sees, he sees God's creation. He hates you and I. Amen. He knows that the two kingdoms have legalities. They have to, listen, if he could kill you all, and some of you all, he's already, he would have done it. He would have done it. But he's held back by law, spiritual law. He's held back from that. And he only has a right to your life of what you give him according to scriptures. Unforgiveness some things we've talked about. Things like that. That gives him that open door to come in and begin to influence to get you to take your life. That's the ultimate goal is to kill you. Satan's ultimate goal, that is his assignment. When he gets assigned to your life, one of them gets in, he opens the doors for his buddies, and their assignment is to kill you and destroy you and destroy your family, your home, your work, everything, your job, your fine. That is their job. That's why we can't give him any place. We can't give him the time of day. And I'm telling you, when, I, when God really moved us in deliverance of the things that I've seen, it's really tight my walk with God. I've cut a lot more stuff. I've already cut a lot out, but there's like, I cut a lot more stuff out. Very cautious because I know how tricky he is. I know how tricky and deceitful he is. We can't give him place. We can't let him in our home. And we have to, as pastors and teachers, we got to teach people about this stuff. We got to teach people about the idols that they have in their home, their idolatry and things like this. Because an idol gives it a point of contact. You know, like the Buddha dolls and all that stuff. That is a point of contact for demons. 
And when you use, I, I, I like these kind of dolls and I like this, and, and you're idolizing that. It's not worth your freedom of your house. It's good to do a spiritual checkup every now and again. Go through, there's a lot of books on this stuff. Find out what witchcraft is. Find a lot of stuff in the stores that they'll, they'll attract demons. Creatures of the night will attract demons. And some people got creatures of the night in their home. That's, I'm telling you, the new age will tell you all this stuff. We have to be equipped. We have to know these things or they're going to come in to us and we're, we're not even going to know. We, they, the devil gets a hold of us sometimes by ignorance. And I'm not be, I'm saying it in a mean way because we don't know. We're not told. We have to equip our people. And we have to, I know it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to talk about some of these things. But you, it has to be said. It has to be. If not, you're not doing them any justice because they're, they're staying in bondage to the devil. And he's destroying their life. It has to be done. It has to be done. So we see they go on depression, decrease in force of activity and emotional condition. The emotional, they're, they're not happy. They don't want to socialize. They don't want to do nothing. Why? Because something has come in there and begin to take over them. That's not, being depressed is not from God. God is joy and peace of the Holy Ghost. Amen? That's what he wants is the happiness and, and love and, and goodness. That's what God wants for us. If you're not, if you don't experience that, then there's something influencing in your life somewhere. Something has come in and trying to take a hold of you. So we see here uh, an emotional condition, either neurotic or psychotic, characterized by feelings of hopelessness and inadequacy. Why well, ain't ever going to be enough? I'm just hopeless. And I'm, I, you know, you know, and it's just the devil beating you up. And that's what he does. And, he, and he'll continue to pound on you. And pound. You're in depression. He's going to pound and pound and pound until you eventually take your life. And that's what he wants to do. And in depression, it's, there is a broken spirit. To remain depressed for a long time, period of time, is of the devil. I know we go through, you know, we go through sadness and times of that because when people die, we mourn. The Bible says we mourn that. But when the mourning goes on to a certain point, then the devil's like, okay, I, I, can, I can come in on this now. He's looking for every opportunity. There's nothing wrong with grieving and, and sadness and things like that, but there comes a point where if it goes too far, it can get demonic. It gives an open door. I'm telling you, folks, it can give them an open door. <clears throat> so the causes of depression could be religion. Religion will put people in depression and bondage because they, they feel like, like, okay, I go to church and I go to the back and I do this and we stand up and we sing our three songs and we got our hymn and we go and we hear a 30 minute, 20 minute sermon and, we, and they go home and their life ain't changed. You're like something's not, something's missing. There's no joy. There's no peace. There's no freedom. See, something's still missing. Religion can bind you. Religion will keep you in chains. But Jesus and his Holy Spirit will keep you free. Traditions, when we, when we value our traditions more than the Word of God, sometimes it makes the Word of God of no effect. The Bible, Jesus he said, your traditions make the Word of God of no effect. Yeah, that's, a, that's exactly what it is. Our traditions. And you got churches, like they're so hung up on their traditions. Well, you know, I got to be out by 12 o'clock. We got to be over the buffet. We've got to beat the Baptists at the buffet. We've got to beat the Pentecostals. You've got to worry about Pentecostals. They're, they're, having a, they're running around a church until 2 o'clock. We ain't got to worry about beating them. We'll, we'll beat them. The Baptists, they, you know, they got their time schedule. But see, we want our tradition. Well, we do it like this, and we got these same songs. and we get, No, God, wants, God says he want, he's knocking on his, his incubator to glory's depart. He said, I want back in my churches. Yeah. I want to have rule and reign in my church to be able to move. If I want you to sing a song or two more, sing a song or two more. If I want you to preach a little longer, preach a little longer. If they don't like it, then sorry. Amen. But we've got to keep going. Yes. Well, I've got to be gone by one. We've got to shut the altar call down at, at a certain time. No, we don't. I tell our people, I love you. Look, service don't end. If you've got to go, go. We're going to be here until the last person gets prayed for. Amen. That's, right. yeah. That's how we have to operate. We give him, we give him room in our life to move. I just dedicate my whole Sunday for God. I don't, worry, I don't plan nothing. Quit planning stuff. Come in there and say, Lord, this is your day. What do you want me to do? What do you have for me? We, I got in this for revival. When I told, when God, I said yes to, I said, God, if you'll use me and you'll use me for revival and you'll, and you'll do for me, you'll do for others what you've done for me and set the captives free and I, they don't need pills and they just need the gospel. I said, use me. I'll be the one. 
And I'll do exactly what you say and I'll go where you tell me to go. Yeah. Who would have ever thought a full gospel preacher, my whole family raised up that way, full gospel, be over in a Baptist church. Yeah. I took criticism for coming here right. three years ago. Well, you going over there? No, I said, look, God's called me over. I don't know, why, I don't know what he's going to do. But I'm going where he's called me. And I trust him. I said, I know what he showed me. And I know what he's going to do. And I trust that it's going to come to pass. Amen. But you've got to trust him. Something, it sounded silly for me to come over in the middle of nowhere. Like I said, boot camp nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> and preach the gospel. Yeah. It sounds silly in the natural. But God's doing something. Amen. I didn't see it. I didn't know it. Then I, it was a walk of faith. He didn't say, well, you go over here, and then you're going to start doing these boot camps, and then you're going to start, we're going to start delivering revival in the area and through the state. I didn't know that. Amen. He didn't tell me that. Right. We're just by faith. Right. We've got to trust him. Like I said, I took criticism for coming here, but I had to trust the Lord. Yeah. You, listen, guys, you just got to trust. Some things he's going to send you to do, it ain't going to, it ain't going to make sense. Because right. we want things, we, we plan it out our way. Well, okay, he's going to do it like this, and no, he ain't going to do it like that. He's going to do it his way. It's like Pastor Greg, who would have thought he was in a little bitty chapel like this when now he's in a great big old tent with three or 4,000 people? Who would have thought? He didn't know that was going to happen. But he stepped out in faith. And the tent just kept growing and growing and growing. That's where we're at. We just got to trust him. Church as usual, them days are over. God's doing something. You know, if you like tradition, that's cool. But God's doing something different. He's got a remnant that's coming up and coming together. That they're, 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 they're done with churchianity. I, I grew up with all that stuff. I said, God, I don't, what I saw and grew up in, I don't want. If that's how church is, you can have it. Because I want to see the power. I want to see the glory. I want to see lives change. I want to see the gospel taken to the streets and the sick get healed in the street and bring a demonstration. Go into the world. That's what I want to see. I said, too many, we just, we consolidated it to a church building. The church is not the building. The church is the people. And we're to go out. This is the equipping center. That's what I tell people here. Our church, well, it's the equipping center. If you want a good little comfortable church, I'm not trying to be mean, but find you another one. This ain't it. Amen. We train and equip. That's right. We want to raise, if you're young in the Lord, that's fine. We'll, 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 do, the, we'll do the diaper changes. We got to do all that. That's cool. We'll do that. But if you're not, and you're raised up, we're going to equip you and send you out. The pampering days are over. Amen. But if you're, if you're young, we'll give you a binky, and when you start crying, we'll, we'll do all that stuff. We'll put you in a playpen if you need to be. You get all out of line. But for the spiritual saints, I thank you. For the spiritual saints, we're going to grow you up and equip you. I'm not, I'm not changing your diapers. The pacifying days are done. And, and God showed me, he said, it should not take 10 years to grow people up, to get them out in the streets to preach the gospel. He said, you do the boot camps, bring them in and raise them up. Do the boot camps. Quickly come in, get them equipped, encourage them and send them out. And keep doing it till they start doing it. It shouldn't take 10 years to get you out on the street. You know the Salvation Army, William Booth done it. You know what they would do? They would go to the brothels and the whorehouses and all this stuff. They would go there, win, win these women to Christ. Within two weeks, have them back in there preaching the gospel again. Same, two weeks, had them ready and they was preaching the gospel, winning those other ladies that were in there. It shouldn't take that long, folks. John 3, 16. That's all you need in your testimony. Take it and go. Take the power of God with you. Amen? Amen. That's where we're at, folks. I'm telling you. That's where we're at. I don't know where that come from or from depression to that, but um, I guess we was in tradition and led over to that. So we see here, triggered by uh, loss or deep trouble. So depression could trigger by loss or deep trouble. A major accident or something like that, things will happen. Um, so we see here, if, I don't know if, I got this, if Christians were depressed, Satan would have free rule in the world. He would have no, no one to oppose him and thwart his evil plans to control the world and its people. So that's, that's what he, his ultimate goal is to control you. We can see that with the one world system coming together and all that. He wants to control us, folks. They want to know how much money you got coming in and out. They want to know everything about you. That's it. That's Satan, is control. But there's freedom in Christ. It's, I'm, I praise God we live in a, in a country, a nation, we're free to preach and do what, what God, you know, what the Lord tells us to do. But he says when we look in depression, Psalm 42, 5 says, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are you disquieting within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. So we see the casting down of soul. Psalm 103, 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and bless all that is within me. Bless his holy name. So we need to bless him. Bless him, bless him, bless him. Oppression. 
Oppression. Have anybody ever been under oppression? It's the pressure to crush, to smother, overpower, overwhelm, harass, to ravish, to rape. That's what oppression is. So that's a step down, level five. Now, people get to level five, most of the time they need, they need help. They need deliverance. They need an outside. Somebody has to come in and help them at that point because they've went past depression. Now they're in oppression. They're in a bad state. They're in a bad state. Like I said, sometimes it happens quick. Vast area of human experience, far deeper um, and more involved than depression. It is to weigh him down or with something he is not able to carry. Oppression through disease, oppression through fear, oppression can be defeated if you exercise your Christian defend, uh, dominion over the devil's power. You do this through faith, prayer, and action. Have faith to command power in your life. Pray to strengthen your inner being. Act to overcome and destroy the works of the devil. Acts 10, 38, we see how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. That's what he did. Healing all who was oppressed of the devil. That's what Jesus came to do. John 8, 44. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. We go into obsession. This is where you cannot save yourself. You need an outside help. It's to besiege, to haunt of evil spirits, to be fixed on a single idea to an unreasonable degree, almost like an OCD or something. They are, people get fixed on something. Something happened or somebody done something to them, they get fixed on that, and they can't get away from it. They, they cannot get that out of their mind. It's caused them to destroy their life because somebody done something bad to them, called them a name, whatever. It began to, to they fixate on that. And it destroys, now all their actions are surrounded about that fixation. They cannot, have you, ever, you ever know somebody that every time you're around them, it's the same thing, the same thing. The same, they are fixated on a certain thing. This is where they're at. Level six. They're fixated. They can't get their mind. It could be a drug. They are just fixated. It's like, and we see this a lot with drugs. It could be, I mean, it could be many. They just cannot get their mind off of it. They, this is something that's come in and took over them. They need outside help. They need outside help. This is, I'm telling you, this is good stuff, man. Lester Summerall, he was one of the greatest, greatest men of, of deliverance ministry. Um, two kinds of obsession. Paul was obsessed with the gospel. <laughs> Amen. If you're going to be obsessed with something, be obsessed with Jesus. Amen. Get filled with him. Be obsessed with the things of God. And then you've got the negative, which destroys the human personality. Christ was obsessed with saving humanity. So you can't save yourself. At this stage of demon domination, I doubt the individual being hurt by Satan could have saved himself without outside assistance. This is the important. That's how, that's how, see how the devil works slowly in your life? When you look at the seven steps, it's one little stage at a time. Oppression or depression, then oppression all the way down. Listen, he wants you, folks. He wants you, folks. Even the Christian. He don't care if your name tags a Christian or if you're saved. He doesn't care. If you give him, if you give him a foothold, he's, he's going to get in. He's going to get in. We put on that full armor. So we see that there's a lot of different things through that. Uh, when we get to this stage where obsession is assumed control of a person's thinking, he needs outside help to be set free. He needs outside help. Um, what is this obsession? By definition, it's an evil spirit deceiving a person and impelling him to unreasonable action. Causes of deception, believing a lie, jealousy, hatred, moral transgressions, protect your willpower, it says. An obsessed person comes to the place where he has no willpower and no strength to resist so as to become a slave. See that? Willpower is one of the greatest gifts that God has given us, warning against uh, hypnotism. Hypnotism, you're giving over your will. A lot of people have been in that. Oh, well, you do hypno. Fortune telling should be avoided. It erodes willpower. Drug and alcohol addictions can obsess a life and cause loss of willpower. Anything that can destroy your willpower should be avoided. Overcoming obsession. Once a person has fallen prey to demonic obsession, he needs a man or a woman of God to pray over deliverance over him in order for him to be free. Do not think of it that it is difficult or impossible to be set free from demon obsession. Jesus can set you free. Amen. Amen. Number seven, possession, to inhabit, to occupy, to control, to hold as property, to dominate, to actuate or rule by extraneous forces. 
Demon possession is the final step by which the devil captures an immortal soul in this. This is where they basically, they have them and they're almost in full control. The demon has took the soul over to the point where he's pretty much controlling them. And that's what he wants everybody. He wants all of us to be like that. So you can either be possessed of God or you can be possessed of the devil. One of them wants to possess you. I'd rather be, I'd rather God, possess, I'd rather the Holy Ghost possess me. When I got born again and filled with the Holy Spirit, it felt like I was possessed with the Spirit of God. That's what it, I mean, it, like it took over and that was it. It's the Lord, I'm yours. This feels good. This, it, it ain't no high like the most high, amen? Oh, amen? When he said Jesus was high and lifted up, he wasn't talking about reefer, amen? He was talking about holy of holy, amen, the holies. When I got set free and the Lord filled me with the Holy Ghost, it was better than any high. I said, look, I've been chasing that high for seven years. I said, Lord, fill me again. Fill me again. Fill me again. So I just got to keep coming back every Sunday. I keep coming back every week. Lord, fill me again because I need you. Fill me again. Amen. Addicted to God now. Addicted to him. I can't help it. I did the cocaine, the alcohol, and all that stuff. And there's nothing, man. When he filled me up, set me up. Listen, I didn't even have a hangover. I ain't had a hangover saying so he keeps filling me up and I still keep dr getting drunk in the spirit. No hangovers. I feel good. There's sometimes I get up an hour or two of sleep and I feel like I slept all night. I'm not even tired. Amen. That's the spirit of God. Man, get filled with God. You won't need all that other stuff. Amen. So we see here um, it's the, the final step. Uh, the step from obsession to passion is a long step. Uh, you don't find too many people in this state, but there are, but there are. Um, and what happens in this is, um, it's the demon possessed person is under absolute, total and complete jurisdiction of the devil. He has no mind of his own. That, that's what I don't like when they use possession in the Bible. People think it's possessed like they're possessing people. And that's where the big confusion comes in Christianity because it's actually being, uh, it's being under the influence so it's the level of influence. You drink one beer, you're under a little bit of influence. You drink 20 or 24, you're under a lot of influence. It's the same thing with the devil. You, you, you let him in a little bit, you're under a little bit of his influence. And he continues. When one gets in, they all... So it's just there's levels. And that's what I wanted you to see because this will take the confusion out of can a Christian have a demon? It'll take that out. Because you have to understand. A lot of people, when they, when they say this stuff and they say it, they, they just don't understand. It hasn't been taught. Because maybe they heard it from somebody else. But when you study this out, you can see, oh, yeah, you can be under the influence. Some of us probably think, you know, if you're, if you're battling anger or you're battling lust or pornography, look, you, and you can be a Christian. You can be battling those things and be under the influence to a certain point, you know. So, and how to know, how to know if you're under the influence of an evil spirit, if you've, if you've fasted, you've prayed, you've crucified the flesh, but you still keep getting drawn in and you cannot stop doing it and there's something urging you on it, you need deliverance. There's something, there's something compelling you to do it, and you don't want to do it. Amen. You need freedom. You need freedom. Like I said, all the most 99% of the people we, we do deliverance on are Christians. They need freedom. Amen. And like I, like I said earlier, you can get saved, which is great, but that don't mean you always get delivered at that time. Just like same thing when you get saved, do you get healed? Is your body healed when you get saved? No, that's what you have ministers for. They minister that to you. They walk you and help you through those things in the full deliverance, in the full healing, so you can be free to serve God. It's hard to serve God if you're not free. Amen? So that, that's what we want. The ultimate goal is to complete freedom. And sometimes, listen, some people it does happen all at once. But sometimes it don't. Sometimes they have to have it ministered to them. They have to have it taught to them. Sometimes deliverance comes through discipleship like we talked about. So, um, yeah. And often we'll see the devil uses the, the people's voices and throats to speak. We see that a lot too. We've seen, we've seen this little girl we was praying for at a, at a restaurant one time, and she had the multiple personality. I call them multiple demons. They all come out. They, listen, they didn't, have no, listen, they didn't have no power against the power of the Holy Ghost. Uh, but she said, I don't know if I believe in God. And I just look, we're going to pray, and we get done praying, then you tell me if you believe. Because I can tell you, what I got on the inside of me, the Holy Spirit, is a lot more powerful than what's on the inside of you. And so let's get you free and then get you to believe. So while we was praying, we got her saved and then we got her delivered. And while we was, was like, come out of her. They said, 
we ain't coming out of her. I said, where in the world this come from? This is a whole different voice. It was like this little, little girl. It was like a deep voice. I was like, man, they're like, we ain't coming out. And I said, what are they telling you? I said, they're coming back. I said, no, they ain't come out of her. And once she, once she got born again and got saved and gave her life to Christ, God freed her. Glory to God. We had some of our men there. It was at one of the local restaurants. and it, That was a little different. But listen, they got different voice. They'll use the people's voice. So, um, so in always you'll see it. The demon possession, you'll see it in the eyes. Somebody that's possessed, their eyes will be hot. They'll have a hollow look to them. You can almost tell every time. And I've even seen it in people that's come in that try to be like they're a seer and all that. You, just, you can tell the soul and the spirit. Amen. You, you can see that in their soul. Uh, the, the Bible says, you know, the window... The, the, the eyes are the window to our soul, right? That's how the demons like to get in, and that's how you'll see them sometimes. And sometimes when we're praying, um, we'll be praying uh, and commanding the demons to come out and manifest, and when they do, the person's eyes and features and everything change. You'll see their eyes change and dilate, and then you have to stop, and you call the person back up, and you'll see they'll always, you'll, they'll like blink, and you'll see a change, and then they'll come to and begin to talk. So that's, that's part of what you do sometimes. And that's when you have to, when, when the demons are being stubborn and don't want to come out, or when the person's not being, not being real um, open to the deliverance and you're kind of trying to pull things out of them, sometimes you'll go back and forth and back and forth. But, so they go easier when the person's ready and uh, open to it. So <clears throat> let's take a short break, and I'm going to just speak for a few more minutes, and then we're going to write in deliverance, if that's okay with you all. Yeah. I, I want to go, I want to cover the part, amen, give God some praise. This is the part we put the old devil on a notice. Um, seven steps to deliverance and seven steps to maintaining deliverance. I want to speak on that for a few minutes. You all got it in your manuals in the back. Uh, 